And I got, I got a word for, for, for all of us today, not just our seniors. I want to speak to them a little bit. But um, so glad you're here today. Hey, Anne Rice was a, um, she's an American author. Um, I don't know if you've read much of her stuff. She wrote a series of books called The Vampire Diaries. Um, I'm not really into vampires and creepy stuff, but um, you might know the first book out of the series became a movie um, with more stars in the film than any film you've never seen, okay? Unless some of you have seen it. Brad Pitt, uh, Tom Cruise, Antonio Bandera, um, Kirsten Dunst. I mean, there were like a whole list of people in this film about vampires. And I say that because you may not know much of Anne Rice. Maybe you know some of her books. She's prolific, wrote a bunch of books. But her faith journey became public because she would write about it and post about it and such. And she grew up in a Catholic, strict Catholicism. And then she tells a story how she rejected it. Okay, so right about the time she goes off to college, about that age, you know, she, she drifted away from the church. And then she lived her entire, uh, most of her adult life as, as an atheist, uh, self-proclaimed uh, secular humanist, she said. And then she comes to Christ um, later in her life. But then there's another twist. About 10 years ago, she posts this. Today, I quit being a Christian. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being a Christian or to being part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to such a quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years, I've tried. I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow me nothing else. Have you ever been there? And we were talking about real life, how to get through what you're going through. The Psalms reveal to us that we all struggle. I love the Psalms. Aren't you grateful for God's word? It's so real. I mean, nothing, it doesn't hold anything back. And today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that does just that. In fact, I want you to grab your Bible, turn to Psalm 13, Psalm 13, because I just wonder, have you ever, like me, okay, mass confession in front of my beloved church family. Past few years, a lot has happened with some of the fringe crazies who claim to be Christians doing things in the name of Jesus, right? And I'm like, not my Jesus. Like, I, you're, I don't, I'm not a part of your tribe. This is not the way of Jesus. And, and some of us have been there, right? Some of us have walked through journeys. Some of you here, like you're you're here at our church because you left that other church or the, you got upset with those people. And that, you know, I always talk to people showing up, hey, I'm going to join our church. I, I was at this other church and so on and so on. And then I was at, then, well, this happened and it really hacked me off. So I'm here today and I'm going to join your church. <laughs> I'm like, mm, not sure we want you, bro. Um, pastors aren't supposed to say that, but um, that's what I'm thinking. I just said it out loud. Um, no, maybe, but. I mean, it happens for all of us. And some of you are here today. And let's be honest. Some of us are here. We've got a lot of questions because we've been hurt, you know, by the church or we, we don't want to identify or maybe in your workplace or at school, our students heading off to college. Sometimes we're slow to say, yes, I'm, I belong to that group. Like I'm a Christian. Uh, I really am, but I've got a lot of questions, you know, that I can't ask Ann, but, um, you know, did, did she really know Christ? Did she really come to faith in Christ? I believe she did, as we'll hear later on. I'm going to let her, her story guide us a little bit. But uh, can, you, can you follow Christ and not be a part of his church? Now, she was leaving her kind of legalistic Catholic church. But she, she was saying, I don't, I don't need those people anymore. I'm out. And, and I can't proclaim that I'm, I'm a Christian anymore. Do you, you understand that a little bit? But this is a classic case of Christian cynicism. That's what it is. And today we're going to address cynicism. And in this short psalm, we're going to look at the cause of cynicism. We're going to look at the crisis that it creates for us all. And a lot of us here today in varying degrees, all of us. And then the cure to criticism. All right. So let's look at first the cause. In this small little 
um, psalm. This is packed. This little bit of text is packed. It's like, an, it's like all the psalms. It's like an espresso shot of theology or an emotion in each psalm. Um, I think it's today's reading. We're reading the shortest um, psalm, uh, shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. Um, and two, two chapters away from the longest chapter in the Bible, right? It's like a long play, Psalm 19, 119. Y'all know this, right? It's like, it's like Freebird. I mean, it just goes on and on. If you don't know the reference, repent, okay? You just need, to, you need a mentor. You need a guide in your life. Okay, um, Leonard Skinner, let's go. Um, has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Uh, so we, we get to his first verse, and he says this, how long, oh Lord? Some of you feel that today. I mean, I want you to think about something you're going through, some struggle, some crisis, and something that, you know, something's going on in David's life, and he's just like, how long am I going to deal with this? And likely it's like within himself, right? How long am I going to struggle with these questions or with depression or with, with cynicism? I don't believe, I want to believe like everybody else. How long am I going to wrestle with this? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Four times in these first two verses, David asks how long. This brings in the element of time, okay? So here's a big part of cynicism. I would describe it this way. Cynicism, here's my little formula. Cynicism is pessimism brought about by crises, maybe in your life, okay, growing up, your story. Pessimism, unresolved, plus time equals, equals cynicism. And some of us are here today. You weren't thinking about cynicism coming in, but now I'm trying to get your mind around this. You're here today and you've been, you've become cynical over time. And, and let me just say it this way. Your spouse, your friends around you, you need to know that that's, it's, this is not a personality trait and it's not a virtue. And yet we live now in the age of cynicism and many of us are cynical today. Because if pessimism says, I'm not so sure about, about those people. Cynicism says, I know about those people. I'm certain. It, cynicism says, I, I don't know if I'm going to keep praying, but I don't know if God's hearing my prayers. But cynicism says, no, I, I know God's not hearing my prayers. Prayer doesn't work. I've stopped praying. See, cynicism is next level. Cynicism has to do with a distrust. Okay, It has to do with, with questioning other people's motives. That's what it is. Cynical people think that they're so smart, right? But are you self-aware enough to even know that you're cynical? Would others describe you as a negative person? Well, how would I know? Ask them. Ask your spouse. Ask people in your life. Am I just, do you always have like a negative vibe? Am I, am I cynical? Because I think many of us are more than we know. And if you're tracking with me here, you're thinking, aren't we supposed to be discerning? Like, aren't we supposed to question things? Yes. First Thessalonians 5, 21, Paul says, uh, and, and this is a good word for our graduates, test all things. And what he's saying is up against the truth of God's word. Test every teacher who comes to you and claims that they're bringing the word of the Lord. How would you know? Students, listen, all of us, you've got to stay in his word, right? If you don't know his word, somebody comes along and you're going to hear this. Yeah, I mean, this was my experience. Go off to college and I'm like, I've never heard that before. That might be true because I, I mean, I know I grew up in this church and, and such, but I've never heard this. You've got to discern if it's true, if it's not true, right? But what happens, see, if we don't do that, then we just enter into what a lot of people do, not, this, not the hard work of testing, whether it's true or false, everything, or how about this, everything pre-approved by my tribe, my people. We see this totally in the world of politics, like got an R by his name, you know, depending on your partisan view. I'm with him. I don't even know what he's talking about, but he's my guy. Like, no, he's off the rails, you know, actually. Or a Democrat, you know, my people, without any kind of discernment at all. And we do this, but here's the thing. Cynicism is the same way. That is laziness, but cynicism is lazy, theologically and spiritually. Because cynicism says, I already know. 
I already know what's up. I've already got that. I'm so whipping smart that those people, right? See, cynics are slow to learn. They're slow to love. And they're slow to serve others. This is why this is so important. And it's a slow fade, gang. Some of you are here and you are cynical and you don't even know how you got there. But over time, you have. And let's be real. A lot of stuff in life can make us cynical. You've been through a lot. But maybe it's impacted your relationships with others more than you know. Rolf Jacobson is a Lutheran Old Testament scholar. And he describes the first two verses uh, that they revolve around uh, three complaints. Uh, David has a theological complaint. He has a personal complaint. And he has a social complaint. Check this out. We've already seen the theological one where he says, Lord, how long are you going to hide your face from me? Now, he's not saying, now this is so important. David's praying throughout, right? This is a prayer. So he's not gone atheist. He's, he's fighting skepticism, but he's praying. He's coming before the Lord. He, he's questioning God's presence in his life. We've all been there. And then in verse two, look at what it says. How long must I take counsel in my soul? Okay, right? Like where else would he go? This is what he's saying. Lord, if you don't speak, where do I, how long am I just going to go to myself? And many of us do that. I'm just going to seek my own counsel. Nobody else gets it, but I could get it and have sorrow in my heart or in my, uh, you know, all the day, all the day long. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? See, his first is a theological crisis or complaint. The second is a personal complaint. He's saying, Lord, I, it feels like you've abandoned me. I don't sense your presence in my life. But friends, listen to this. David's in there. He's in because faith and doubt can coexist. In fact, any thinking person is going to doubt, right? And so, again, students, so much I can say here. As you head off to college, stay in. And yes, with all the doubts, wrestle with your doubts. David realized, I can't really trust myself. How long I've got to just turn to me? Because I've got limited knowledge and I am inadequate to solve this problem. Some of you hear that today. You need to turn to the Lord in prayer, believing. The third complaint is social. Because David feels like others now. He's, he's losing. His enemies victorious over him. You ever feel this way? I think this is possible for us today as, as Christians in, our, in this secular age. And that David is saying, hey, not only are people against me, but those who are against God, like my people, are winning. It seems. This is David's complaint. This is real. He's got this um, fourfold you know, question, how long, how long, how long? And the succession ramps up in intensity. This is like superlative angst. This is real prayer, by the way. Sometimes prayer is that. It's not, Lord, thank you for this food and your blessing in my life. I love you so much. I just love you. No, it's like crying out to God. This is real. Because we all wrestle with this, right? David is grieving. And he knows something is fundamentally wrong in the world. Like, this is not the way it's supposed to go. See, Anne Rice's testimony... She, she's saying, I tried this for 10 years. How long will I put up with all this, all the, the challenges? And some of us feel that way today. I want you to think about applying this message. What are you walking through? What crisis is unresolved in your life? And again, maybe it's very personal. How long will I wrestle with anxiety or depression? 10 years? Maybe. How long... Will I keep asking God to do this thing in my life? 10 years? Perhaps. Because that's life. So what do we do? Do we give up? Do we grow cynical? Do we spin out? David's going to help us here. Because you see, I don't know Anne's really, you know, did she, what, what does she mean? She give up. I tried. I've given up. See, what happens for a lot of us, and we say this often here, you need to know this. The gospel is not, Christianity is not work harder, get better, try more. That'll wear you out. Be like Jesus, right? We talk about this often. Be like Jesus. That's just a religion that bears his name. That's all that is. That's crushing, by the way. Christianity instead is surrendering ourselves to him. I can't do this. I can't justify myself. I can't validate my existence. I'm trying and I'm tired. 
Of course you're tired. Because you weren't created to live that way. You're created and said to surrender to God and say, Lord, I'm yours. You've done everything possible. You lived the perfect life for me because I couldn't. You died on the cross for my sin so that I could be rescued because I couldn't. And I just give you my life. Christianity is about surrendering so that you will be justified by him and what he's done for you, not your works. Those are different things altogether. Are you tired today? Maybe that's the challenge. Give up. Surrender. And if not, I would ask you, how's it going for you? I mean, working harder to justify and validate your own existence. And we're going to see this when you head off to college. Here's what I remember was so challenging for me, students, was, um, wow, not just, hey, nobody knows. You know, like I was, I was kind of a stud in high school. I don't mind telling you. all I was kind of, the, you know, whatever you did. Nobody knows what you did. Nobody cares. And what's worse is, you're like, I don't know many people on campus here, but nobody knows me, right? To be known and loved. Not to be not known in love, that's just sentimentality, right? But to be known and loved, now that's the love of God. And that's the love of people around us. That's why we need to keep turning to him, right? And so what we see here is this, this complaint that David has over and over. And, and, and I want to ask you are, you, are you there today? Are you, are you cynical? Are you doubting the motives of other people? Maybe doubting humanity in general. And, and I'm helping you realize that the Spirit is showing you, I kind of enter into my world and I'm cynical. It's worth unpacking. How did you get there? It was a slow fade. But again, you could ask people around you, don't, don't give up. Like David, I just say, stay in. Because let's be honest, there's a lot that can make us cynical in this world. How long will these mass shootings keep going on? Can we bring some resolution to this thing? How long will partisan politics continue to divide our, our leaders so they get nothing done? How long will this crisis continue at the border? How long will we continue to question the sanctity of every human life from the womb to the tomb. How long? I mean, it's on and on, right? How long will men be dressing up like women and are competing in women's sport? How long is this going to go on? You see, if we're not careful in a secular age, we can just grow cynical like everybody else. But don't miss this. In, in, the, in all of that, cynicism is a choice. Life doesn't make you cynical. You make you cynical. Your response to life makes you cynical. And David's going to show, how do I combat that? Because there's real practical truth in this message. So the cause of cynicism, struggle plus time, okay? Now let's talk about the crisis. Here's the crisis that I'm trying to create in your mind on this journey. The inflection point here is, will I stay in or not? Like... I talked to a young, a young uh, adult recently, a man, this is, a, again, probably a good word for our graduates, who said, man, I just, I don't know where I got the idea that life was going to be simple and easy and it was all going to be up and to the right. I don't know where I got that idea. Now, you know, I'm this old, you know, eternal optimist. And I believe, by the way, Christians should be the most optimistic people on the planet, combating cynicism. You want to stand out in a crowd? Trust the Lord, be optimistic, and just love people right where they are. That's radical. That looks like Jesus. You want to join the crowd, be cynical with everybody else. Just complain about everything, right? You've seen it. Or some of you are fanning those flames. And that's not going to help us because we are to be light in the world. Not this dimming, dimming darkness that can take place. But what we see here in verse Three and four, here it is. Consider and answer me. O Lord, my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now we have a threefold demand of God from David. And he's saying, first of all, he says, Lord, consider. That is, look, look at me. Lay your eyes on my situation. So again, some of you aren't even doing that. Lord, I'm calling out to you. And the Lord goes, that's exactly what I wanted. You're trying to solve this yourself. No wonder you're growing cynical. 
Now you're turning to me. That's the first step for some of us here. You're not even praying. Cynicism leads to a lack of prayer. I don't know if God even, uh, I don't know if he's all loving, all really, all powerful. I'll just stop praying. Your prayer life reveals your cynicism, you see. And then secondly, he says, answer me. Okay, so don't just look at my problem, do something. And then lastly, he asks him to enlighten him. Okay, light me up. Like if you don't light me up, I don't know where I'll go. I just got to turn to myself is what he says. David is recognizing, I don't have it in me to fix this problem. And I can't understand it. So Lord, give me, give me light or my light is going to grow dimmer and dimmer until I'm just snuffed out. And some of us need to pray that prayer today. Have you grown cynical and you're walking God? Are these your prayers? Is this your constant, Lord, light me up. Show me your word. Show me the truth here because I'm fading. See, that, that, and that was Anne Wright. What she's confessing is like Gandhi's famous quote. Um, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. See, what happens in cynicism, are you catching this? It is a prideful, arrogant position. Because what you're doing is saying, here it is. You've taken your eyes off the light of the world and you've put it on everybody else who's a sinner just like you. And so we, we well, I don't, you know, those people, right? The, the, they don't get it. See how prideful that is? I get it. They don't get it. And you know what? You end up, that's what happens. Maybe like, like Anne Rice. You end up with a church of one. And you're the head of the church, you're, you're the savior, you're, you're the one. Even worse than that, that is a dark and dangerous place to be. And so I'm going to tell our graduates today, and this applies to all of us, but listen, the first Saturday, I was about to say the first Sunday you're, you're on the college campus, Saturday, make plans to be in a certain church on Sunday. Your first week there. Because for a lot of us, Sunday worship starts, let's be real, Saturday night. And then we wrestle with whether we're going to make it or not. Don't decide Sunday morning. You're not going to make it. What you need to do is decide ahead of time. And we can help you find churches in whatever college town, wherever you find yourself. And there's a great one right nearby if you're in school around here somewhere. Um, (laughs) There's an awesome church. I mean, better than all those others. (laughs) Um, okay, so the problem, though, with, with the whole, this whole, she was deconstructing, Ann Rice was, before we were even talking about it. The problem is you may not end up isolated. So, see, cynicism can lead us to just see the whole world, um, you know, as dark and not quite as smart as us. I heard a, a quote years ago, I read it somewhere. The man with Limburger cheese on his upper lip thinks the whole world stinks. You see, well, I don't know much about Limburger cheese, um, but it's potent, evidently, and it ages like cynicism over time. And then you're cynical about everything and everybody. And, and, and this is where this really kicks in. If it's, if it's unaddressed, you don't grow better in sanctification. You grow bitter. And your light that is supposed to to be showing the world in full color what it is to look like Jesus is, is dimming and getting darker. Everything's gray when you're a cynic. And cynics aren't fun to be around. But this is what Jesus is getting to in Matthew um, 6, where in verse 22, 23, he talks about how the light is, um, he says, if your eye is good, then the whole, your whole world is lit up, basically. The whole body's lighted up or lit up. And he says, if if your eye is bad, then your whole body, your whole life is dark. He's saying, if you can't see, if you don't have light in you, you're going to see the world in a different way. It's going to be dark. And then he says, how great is that darkness? And this is where a lot of us can go. Even as believers, instead of seeing the world as beautiful and wonderful and colorful, we see the world through cynical eyes. Everything's gray, and we cease to be the light 
of the world because we've taken our, our focus off the light of the world and we've put it on other people around us. And friends, that, that's fatal. Because just maybe, watch this, he just might be at work in people's lives around you like he is in your life. And maybe your optimism and your hope in Christ is going to change someone's life. You see, if you're always the contrarian, if you're always so whipping smart, and everybody else is this and that, you're so cynical, that says more about your own character than it does the character of other people. And many of us live that way. Not a bright witness in the world. And what we need to do is, is, is say, man, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Well, we'll get there. David tells us how, he tells us the way out, all right? So look at verse four. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Don't miss this. David's still praying, right? He's fighting cynicism because it's a fight. But here's, how, here's, one, here's one sign. You know you're cynical if you don't pray. Because now you're questioning God's motives. Now you're wondering if he is even like David. Are you even present? Do you see my situation? Cry out to him. That's a prayer. These are prayers, right? In fact, tonight we're going to gather. You can come join us. We're going to be up in the loft, which is right above us. At 5 o'clock, we're gathering for what we call the greater work. Because prayer is the greater work. I think it was Oswald Chambers says, you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. And we're going to pray with hope and expectation. And we're going to pray over our summer events. We're going to pray over VBS and, and youth camps and sports camps, all the things. We're going to hear about those things. We're, going to, we're asking anyone going on a mission trip this summer to come join us. We're going to pray over you. We're going to pray with you. We want you to come in. We're going to pray with hope. Because we still believe that God is at work. Growing cynicism, you see, is often accompanied by a lack of prayer. And let me just say this too. This is why this is so important to resolve. And for our seniors, do this before you head off to school, but every one of us, before you head into the week. You keep asking how long, it'll eliminate the need for an answer. And you'll drift off like so many people have away from Christ and his church. So what do we do? Here we go. The cure for cynicism. All right, this has been a dark and negative sermon. Now, we're going to pull out of this thing. David offers three things that bring us out of cynicism. Look at verse five. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. David says, here it is. I'm going to trust. We sang about this earlier. I will trust in your steadfast love. Now, this is a technical term. In the Hebrew, this word is hesed. Hesed. And it means covenantal love. And I want to unpack this for a moment. This is so important. Because we talk about, you just got to believe. Like, if you leave this message, y'all, you've been cynical. Come on, just believe. What does that even mean? Ask Jesus into your heart. What? What does that mean? What does it mean to believe? And, and this helps us understand. Has said helps us understand what it is to believe. It's what David says. I mean, in different words, place your trust in. Now, what does this mean? Has said goes all the way back to Genesis 15. And we see it with Abraham and David. I mean, uh, Abraham and God. God says to Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. You're my guy. Your people are going to be my people. And I'm going to bring you to the promised land, ultimately which becomes this type, right, of, of what happens then in the New Testament with Jesus. But what the hesed is, this covenantal love, was when, and then he tells, he tells Abraham to do this. It's kind of a weird story, but it really helps you understand this, I think. Um, he says, what I want you to do, I want you to sacrifice animals. You're going to cut up all these carcass of animals because there always had to be blood sacrifice, right? Somebody had to pay the price if there's going to be any justice. So he, he cuts up the animals, and then God tells him, okay, lay them out, but make a path in between them. Like, what? Because what this was, this was, an, this was a classic, in fact, at the time, it was a kind of treaty between a lord and a vassal. And basically what it was, was the two would, go, would walk through the dead, <laughs> this is weird, I know, the dead carcasses, as if to say, if I break my part of the covenant... May this be me. May this happen to me. 
I'm all in, like a blood covenant, right? But in this case, God reveals himself. It's, it's uh, through a, this pot, this, this flaming uh, lamp, and, and God goes through the, 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 uh, the carcasses, okay, the, the sacrifices. God goes through the animal, the blood sacrifices. Abraham doesn't. This is one-way love. It's a covenant from God to Abraham. Abraham can't break the covenant because it's unconditional. It's God coming to him. Now, watch this. 2,000 years later, another blood covenant would be made between God and those who trust in him. Jesus comes, not, not animal sacrifice, but a human body. He brings himself the perfect sacrifice on the cross between two broken, pierced bodies on the cross, the thieves on either side of him. And in in an act of one-way love, he comes to us and he says, just place, here it is, your trust in what I have accomplished for you. Again, I've lived the perfect life for you. I have died on the cross for your sins because you couldn't. And now you receive, you believe, you trust that this is true by faith, not your works. So that you cannot boast, you don't bring anything. This is one way covenant. But now you have an option. You can decide to receive or not. And that's where we get tripped up. I just can't bring something to the table. Like, I mean, come on, I can bring a little, and God said, no, 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 nope, no. And so what you're doing it to believe is to say, I am justified by what he has accomplished for me, not by anything that I do. And I know this messes with us because faith is hard. Listen, praise God, it's faith. You can't be smart enough. You can't be good enough. And so it is surrender, isn't it? I will no longer seek to justify myself. I'm done. And we believe. And so David tells us, you can, he's pointing us to really the hesed, the steadfast love, the covenantal love of Jesus. And so he comes to us and we receive. So he says, there's three things. Trust, rejoice, he says, in your salvation. Okay, trust, rejoice. And the third one is here in verse six. Give thanks. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Friends, listen, this is life. Life is a response to all that he has done for us. So the cure to cynicism is trusting in him, rejoicing in what he's done. Now it's joy, the opposite of cynicism. And to be grateful. So what will be your story? The Lord brought you here this morning. For you to be challenged with your cynicism, will you continue down that path or will you change today? Practicing these three things will decimate cynicism in your life over time or daily. You got to keep, stay at it, right? What will be your story? In her book called Out of Darkness, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap us up here, Anne Rice wrote this beautiful story about coming to faith in Christ. And I'm like, wow, later in your life, why didn't you come back to this? Because listen to this, and maybe she did. But in the moment, uh, she writes this, in the moment of surrender, I let go of all the theological or social questions which had kept me from God for countless years as a secular humanist, an atheist. I simply let them go. There was a sense, profound and wordless, that if he knew everything, I did not have to know everything. And that in seeing or in seeking to know everything, I'd been all my life missing the point. No social paradox. Listen to this. No historic disaster. No hideous record of injustice or misery should keep me from him. 
No question of scriptural integrity. No torment of the fate of this or that atheist friend or gay friend. No worry of those condemned or ostracized by my church or any other church should stand between me and him. The reason, listen to this. It was magnificently simple. He knew how everything or why everything happened. He knew the disposition of every single soul. He wasn't going to let anything happen by accident. Nobody was going to hell by mistake. Wow. Friends, she wrote this then. The world of atheism was cracking apart for me. Just as once the world of Catholic faith had cracked apart, I was losing my faith in the non-existence of God. Some of you here today, perhaps, or all of us in varying degrees, you need to lose your faith in your faithlessness. For many of us, my hero, Tim Keller, wrote this. Cynicism lives only by refusing to apply the same razor edge to itself as it does to all else. Are we ever cynical about our cynicism? See, here's the thing. Let me challenge this with this, and I'll close. We're going to close together, proclaiming a truth together um, before we go. Instead of raging against the world, what are you going to do? Instead of wondering how long will the border crisis continue, go there. Go on one of our mission trips. Find yourself in South Texas with our partners who are serving people who come, yes, at some point, perhaps come across the border who need Jesus. Like, do something. How long will we wrestle with the sanctity of life? When do I get to vote again? No. Yes. Get involved in a ministry like Thrive. You can do something. Instead of raging at the television or your, your news post or something. You're, you know, you just, we, we can do something, friends. We can act. What are you going to do? Instead of saying, well, how long until I find the perfect church? If you're looking for the perfect church... Um, join ours and you'll mess it up real quick. Um, it won't be perfect anymore. So yeah, don't join. Okay, no. How long? How long are you going to find yourself in isolation? Because everybody else kind of gets under my skin. You're not going to find the perfect church. How long? Today's your day. How long will we you know, continue to see racism raise its ugly head? How long will we continue to wonder, what do we do about immigrants and and refugees, those seeking political asylum? Go two miles away to Vickery and serve through Jack Lowe Elementary or the ministries there, the Bob Herrera Center. Do something. The way out of cynicism is, yes, in your head and in your heart, But the way to move out of yourself is what cynicism is, is to get involved in the lives of others and serve others. That's how you're going to do it. So the question today becomes, what are you going to do? For some of you, it really does mean join the fellowship of the church. Stop trying to isolate yourself. Join our imperfect church as we seek to, to pursue and know a perfect Savior. Today. Receive Christ if you've never received him. Trust in him, as I explained, what that really means. Trust in what he's done for you. Give your life to him. Come and and join the fellowship. Trust in him. Rejoice in him. And give gratitude to him. Cynicism cannot stand in the face of gratitude. That's it. Proclaim your thanksgiving and reasons you give thanks to him. But what we're going to do before we go... We've got time to just proclaim together. I'm going to ask our our worship leaders to come up here, and we're going to do this. We're going to proclaim a truth together, that he works all things for our good. 
He's at work in your life, friend. Some of you become cynical because you're like, I don't see God at work. That's what David is like. Where are you? Do you even see me here? And we're going to be able to proclaim together because it helps when we do it together. There's strength and confidence together as we go into this week. Because here's what we know. God is at work. And we are the ones who are like clay, as Isaiah says. We're just in the hands of a potter. Give yourself as clay to him. Offer yourself as a canvas and say, Lord, paint a beautiful picture in my life and through my life. Because my, my light is getting dimmer. But light me up with hope and confidence today so I can worship you. So let's all stand together and our team's going to lead us. Okay.